Born. <laughs> See? I started at the little TV. Already, already like, oh. though, there's the camera right there with there the red. The yeah. Yeah. Hello, yeah so, all right. So here I am with actual actor, uh, multi-talented singer, uh, comedian, yes. all around athletic bike riding guy, Jason Kravitz. What's up? Oh, wait a minute. Look, no, wait. Hold on. Wait. Hold on. Hold on. I have, I have like some, some music I can cue. I, I was going oh, to yeah. do this instead. Hold on. Let's start with that. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, multi-talented actor, singer, comedian, Jason Kravitz. Thank you very much. I'm so... <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> That's more appropriate. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, Jason is a guy that I hang out with a lot. Um... We go to baseball games, we play poker. Uh, I find him enormously funny and inventive, and he's been going on a world tour recently uh, with a concept that he has, which is a fully improvised evening of cabaret. Uh, so uh, I just kind of want to start talking about that because that's like something that you've been doing for a long time, actually, you know, created the entire really idea of this. So talk about what that means to do an evening of fully improvised cabaret. Sure. Uh, first, I want to discuss my uh, man cave attire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought we were doing an audio podcast, so I, uh, no shower, just hop on the bike, come on up here in 80 degree humidity and, uh, you know. I um, think you look hot. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Good, because my knees, I think, are featured prominently. Yeah, in no, it's good. Hey, look, I got, I got the shoes. <laughs> Well, let's, Cece, come here. We can feature Cece as well. That's better, because Cece's much more attractive than both of us. Cece, where are you? She's probably pooping. Yeah, she's pooping. She will make an appearance, and she's the official uh, mascot of our broadcast. The love bug. Um, so, yeah, the show is called Off the Top. It, it started just as an idea. Um, I wanted to do a parody of a cabaret. Uh, you know, cabaret where someone gets up and sings, and, and a lot of the times has a theme of the story of my life and how I became who I am or a retrospective on my accomplishments or my songs or whatever. And I just always wanted to parody that. But I also have always been doing improv and I found kind of accidentally that musical improv was something that I uh, had a certain proficiency at. Just being able to rhyme things. I was rhymed, I was right, you know, uh, some funny rhyming things, Dr. Seuss parodies and things. So rhyming came naturally to me, and I was already a singer, so I thought, why not give this a shot? And I started putting it together, and I guess the first show was about three and a half years ago. Uh, it was my first, gosh, was it maybe even longer? I don't even know. Somewhere around three and a half years ago. Where did you start singing? Where did you get, like, did, was that from musical theater that you did a lot of I've singing? Been singing since I was a kid. My family was very musical. Right. So we always, uh, as a family, would sing. Uh, three siblings and we always we would perform we performed at uh, nursing homes and county fairs and things like that and uh, where I grew up uh, in Maryland and uh, it was always part of what I did and then you know of course in high school we had a band my brother and I were in a band together and like a rock band like band? a rock band see band, because man. when you're talking about me I got my clarinet over there different band <laughs> that's, that's a marching band with orchestra <laughs> a band Band for us was a yeah, rock band. An actual band band. And we were playing Van Halen and we were playing <laughs> Journey. Well, what, are you playing lead sticks. guitar in this? Or what, what you uh, at first I didn't. At first I wasn't playing guitar at all. I didn't know how to play guitar. <laughs> I was just the, um, I was the manager. Yeah. Oh, oh, you weren't even like in the band? No, I was like... singing harmony. My brother had the Steve Perry, <laughs> Dennis D. Young high voice. Yeah. And I was singing harmonies. That's what I was thought I was good at. I never thought of myself as a lead singer. Um, and oh, it was a great story about that actually. The one time I sang lead, we were, we were doing for some reason we were very poppy in our choices. And oh. at the time there was a song, oh god, I embarrassed myself. I'm just I'm gonna cry again. It's all gonna come back. <laughs> it was called Sad Eyes. Yeah. You had know, this song from uh, the seventies. You no, wouldn't. No. It, it, it's a really terrible light rock <laughs> classic from the eighties, <clears throat> early early eighties. Yeah, 70s. I missed all of that. Oh god, God bless you. And uh, <laughs> my brother didn't know the words, so I said, I'll sing it. Because it was my turn to be the lead singer of the band. And I premiered that song at <laughs> Anne Marie Osgood's 16th birthday party in the backyard. Are you also 16? I was, uh, you know, 17. Uh. <clears throat> my brother was 15, she was 16. And uh, so I'm singing this song. It's kind of high, but I'm going for it. <sighs> the dog just started <laughs> It was caged up because there was a party going on, and this dog and her dog just started, 
and only on my song. <laughs> There's a memory for you. That's my embarrassing memory of me singing. But, so somehow you were encouraged by this. And kept I was going. encouraged. You kept singing for yeah, that. Yes. Yeah. So uh, well, look, uh, yeah. you get any reaction from like a crowd? It's a good one. You know what I mean? Exactly. So they, so you the made howling, them have a reaction. Yeah, man. It was rock and roll. Um, <laughs> but no, I kept singing. I did musical theater in high school, and then I did musical theater out when I graduated. I was doing some musicals. <clears throat> but I think my just, parents saw you. No. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty like you know they went on like a, a senior church trip to New York and like their only like sort of like show that everyone would agree on was Drowsy Chaperone. And they saw me most you likely. Know, I was uh, in most of the shows. I think that's like yeah, I'm pretty sure that that like it's sometime in like the early aughts or yeah mid aughts or something like that, 2005 or something like that. They saw you. <laughs> Well, the fun part about the singing was I, I've always thought of myself as a kind of uh, an okay singer. You know, I always thought my voice was a little bit nasal or not quite right, good for character stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, I really didn't get any confidence in myself as a as a full voice singer <clears throat> till recently, actually, till the last like five, ten years. I've started singing more and especially doing this show. Uh I studied a little bit more about my voice, but I also just was singing more, and I realized that, oh, my voice is actually, I mean, it's still quirky, it's still got, I've still got things I'd like to work on with my, uh, you know, with my tone and with my breath control and things like that, but... Do you ever take lessons? I have, yeah, yeah, and they're really helpful, but, you know, I don't take them often enough. Right. Um, And I have some great teachers that I really admire, Uh, but, you know, it's something that I'd like to keep going because I think now there's a purpose for it it's like right. it's like when when someone does a role and they have to be really buff like uh, what's his name from uh, from the office uh uh, who played oh, Jim? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dan. What? A, no, I don't know his name. I they, they, uh, yeah, I, I'm so sorry. Chris Krasinski. Krasinski. Yeah, that's it. And he um, he you know had to be buff for, for the, like Seal C- or for the right. like Benghazi movie. Right, right, right. <laughs> so like that's when you have a reason to do things. Right. So it's like now that this show has kind of taken off, I've had more of a reason to work on my voice. Yeah, and I I've, I've really grown comfortable with singing, and I realized that I have a nice range to play with. So. So it went from somewhat of a like a comedic effect to something that you're like, okay, well, actually, I'm, I am pretty good at this, and I don't have yeah. to like play it as like a character piece necessarily. Right, right. No, I mean it's surprising to me because that's how I've always, for so much of my life, for four fifths of my life, I've thought of myself as like a character singer, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't have a voice that could carry, you know, its own. It could carry a song right. outside of harmony or shtick, and. Uh, and it's been a really nice thing to realize and give me a lot more confidence in this show. I well, love this guy. Thanks. I should probably turn that down. That's fascinating. Your, your television knows me. Oh, my God. Well, what, what could happen? What could happen? The government, they, they, the government they, they write, is watching. They can write. Um, I, I think I understand what's happening. Yeah, I know. Look, we can. I think, hold on one second. I'm, I'm going to um, change the settings here. Uh, we can view the comments. Yeah, look, yeah, hold on. Yeah, there we go. View comments. Mr. Baltimore, yeah. Well, hello, Mr. Baltimore. Yeah, you definitely know this guy. He's been on every... Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to keep that voice on because it's a little... I want that to follow me around. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to buy this cup of coffee. I know this guy. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want that to follow me around, too. <laughs> You just have you just take the soundboard around. You know, you get on the on the subway. Somebody gives you some shit. You'd be like, "Yep, I like it." You get the laugh and track. the laugh track too. Yeah. I love the blunt cut. It's a little uh, uh, when when Monty Python would do like the laugh track and put the blunt cut. In oh the yeah, end. the it end just of it fucking like, cracks me up. At the end of it. So long. Uh, the practice. You know, that's correct. That's correct. You got. <laughs> I didn't sing on that show. <laughs> But, uh, yes, I was on the practice. I was a mean... That's actually a funny story. Can I tell that? Yeah, go, please. Let's do it. Uh, I went out to L.A. with a comedy show. I went out with a partner, a guy named Joel Jones, who is a dear friend of mine still. What was your name of your team? Kravitz and Jones. (laughs) It had a better rhythm than Jones and Kravitz. Yeah, no. Uh, Da-da-da-da. But we were really fun. It was fun to work with him. We had a fun sketch show, which involved a lot of music, a lot of parody. And uh, we brought it out to L.A., and uh, were invited quickly, uh, very last minute, to the Aspen Comedy Festival, 
uh, which was an HBO festival there, which was used to be the biggest comedy festival in yeah. the world. Now uh, it's, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. And I think Just for Labs in Montreal is the big one. But um, <clears throat> we took the show there. We had a great house. It was like everybody in the business comes to see those shows. And suddenly we were the toast of the town for about a couple of months <laughs> when that wave crested and failed. We ended up just out in L.A. And I got an audition for um, for the practice eventually. And I didn't tell anybody that I had done comedy. And my agent didn't tell anybody that we had done comedy. It was just like straight. Uh, this is a serious actor from New York which I had never worked in New York at that point except doing my own comic material. So sometimes you got to, you know, not tell people about what your past. And here's the mascot. Here's CC. CC the love bug. All right. Stay away from the water. You can come over. Sorry. I won't let you drink it. So I appreciate that story. Thank you for the for yeah. the sidebar. A little sidebar. Now I'm going to go straight back into what I was going to do. The practice. What? <laughs> yeah. It's the, the disembodied voice. CC. It's all good. Chill. It's all good. So, oh, she's got a sweet mohawk. Um, long story short, I've been to your shows, uh, to this improvised cabaret, a number of times now, and I think actually your voice has an, a, an earnest quality to it that with its little faults that you might find actually lends itself to having um, a fragility that is... Uh, like it's about to fall apart no, any time. No, it leads to like this degree of intimacy with you that you're not right. perfect. You know what I mean? Is that like being the thin, thinnest kid at fat camp? No, because reference? no, because I would use the same thing. And this, you know, how much I love this band. So this is a high compliment. Tom York. Yeah, yeah. Also has like what I would consider to be like a classically somewhat flawed voice. I think sometimes it's just about being confident in what you're doing and confident about what you're singing. And and, and I think that gives people a sense that you're in control of what you're doing. I so whatever this is kind of K-O-O-L. I have no idea what that is, but right. thanks for that. All right. Um, Maybe I should turn all of that down. I don't know. It's kind of entertaining. You like it? Okay, I'll keep whatever. it. As long as it doesn't, uh, you know... Throw I did this. I did this with. <laughs> I, I accidentally left this feature on for like this older, serious, like Pulitzer Prize winning composer. <laughs> oh, cool! Oh, I'm glad you think it's cool. Great, Thanks, man. man. Awesome. <laughs> it confused the living daylights out of me. This like 65 year old Juilliard composer is like, now what's Who's what's happening on the screen over here? So, yeah, you know, yeah. we were talking about privacy before we started. Oh yeah. So yeah, actually. That's actually an interesting conversation. So we're talking about going through the airport. I have this thing called clear. Um, As you hold up the two fingers. Well, that's how you do it. You go, you put you put it on this little screen. But I had to basically give the government all of my biometric data, which I assume that it or already has. has. I mean, yeah. come on. After 2001, if the government doesn't have all of our information, it's doing a really shitty job because it seems <laughs> like everybody else is. Exactly. And I'm pretty sure that the government <clears throat> actually has much more massive resources than we than we even know. Between Google, Amazon, and Zappos, I think they've got <laughs> You know what I mean? I've been fully measured and vetted. Yeah. <clears throat> they know your inseam, they know your shoe size. They got my fingerprints. I figured they already have my fingerprints somewhere. I don't know where the fuck they would get it, but they got it from somewhere, I'm sure. You know, I gotta say, there was a there was this thing about medical records, too, and uh, uh, I went to a doctor recently, and it was a new doctor, and there was medication that was going to be prescribed in the future, and he's like, Google has your info, definitely. I think you're right. And so this person, uh, the doctor was like, oh, I'll sign you up for this um, online prescription company. You don't have to go to the store. You don't have to go anywhere. It's like, all right, fine, do that. Here's my information. I get it. Like 10 minutes after I leave the doctor's office, I get a text, and it says, hello, dear. My name is blah, blah, blah. I'm your pharmacist. And was first name. My name is Angela. I'm your pharmacist here at blah, blah, blah. Just send me your information about your insurance and we'll get right started. And I was like, wait. Uh, and then it said, love Angela. I was like, who are you? And will you marry me? Because I mean, that's like so personal and intimate. I don't need that relationship with my I pharmacist. I definitely don't. I, you know what I mean? I don't need a note from my like physical therapist that has like kisses at the end of it. Exactly. <laughs> And so then I ignored it, and then I got another message about an hour later going, never mind, we've got your insurance information, uh, just tell us when you want the stuff delivered. I ignored that. An hour later, I get, 
congratulations, we were able to apply a coupon and reduce your copay by 50%. I was like, would you please stop fuck? getting in touch yes. with me? I don't know who you are, Angela, and why you love me. But there you go. Blowing up your phone. Yeah. So there you go. That was my, uh, that's my, you know, new invasion of privacy situation. Somebody out there loves me, and it's a pharmacist named Somebody Angela. Somebody right here loves you. And Cece, of course. Yes. It's a dog. So, so how do the people Cece? There you go. So you do a number, a, a number of things on on the. Uh, I, I'm going to keep bringing go back this to the show. Back yeah, now go. To the show. That's that's the fun part. The thing that uh, the thing that that I didn't realize when talking to you when you were creating it is that these shows have like a an arc to them, like both in your in your in your parody, but it's mostly like you, you approach these songs pretty seriously. It's like you 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 have funny material, but. Part of the reason that it's funny is that we first of all we also need to mention that you have a full band behind you while you're doing this. Yeah. You're doing Angela you're, wants a love connect. Great. So, <laughs> is that is that you, Angela? Yeah. No. So uh, about so uh, you know you've got three other people behind you also who are improvising these songs. So. How do you rehearse that? How do you rehearse the structure of like? Do you say okay from from this beginning kind of like bang up number? We're gonna probably go into like this downbeat. Yeah, I studied a lot of cabaret. I went to a lot of cabaret shows, mostly. Thank you very much. At Fifty Four Below in New York, which is um, one of the premier Broadway cabaret, if not the premier Broadway cabaret venue. So I went and saw a lot of shows there and started looking at the choice, the song choices, and how the evening flowed. And, yeah, a lot of times you start with a big number that's a very welcoming number. Sometimes you, people start with a slow number to bring people in. A funny number brings people in. So I started making choices about, and then, you know, depending on what you just did is going to determine what you do next. Mm. So I started realizing, at first, when I first did the show, I didn't, um, I didn't kind of come up with the song styles an order of the song styles ahead of time. I just kind of flowed one to the next, whatever I felt like singing. <clears throat> and I realized that was really doing a disservice to the show because, you know, people like an arc to mm -hmm. their evening. And so I started putting together what I call a skeleton. You start up with a big bang and open a number, and then you move into a wistful memory number that <laughs> talks about your youth. And then you go into maybe a very, you know, uh, youthful sounding, you know, modern style Broadway, Jason Robert Brown style, you know, you know Bill Finn style Broadway number. Then you go into like a swingy song that you might see in a lounge act or something like that. And it just moves along like that. And <clears throat> that's pretty consistent uh, show to show, but that might, I'm starting to open it up a little bit and give room for some more improvised skeleton. Within that though, each song, when I work with my accompanist especially, is uh, we just examine what makes a song a song. You know, what is the what are the key components when you're parodying anything mm -hmm. or even paying homage to something? You're looking for the key components of what makes a song a song. And there are when you really, you know, hash it out, this isn't new information to a lot of people who are already composing music, but there's certain styles of songs. There are songs called catchphrase songs, where every verse ends with <clears throat> or starts with a catchphrase. For example, somewhere over the rainbow is a mm -hmm. catchphrase song. Every verse starts with Somewhere Over the Rainbow, except for the bridge in the middle. Or there's a song called uh, Haven't We Met, or How About You, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. I like New York in June, how about you? I like a Gershwin tune, how about you? How about you is the name of the song, comes in a lot. Bada bing, bada boom, hit, hit, hit. Boom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Haven't We Met by, uh, as sung by Mel Torme, you know. <laughs> you know, I ordered some rain for tomorrow, the sky will be sunny but wet, and out of nowhere you're suddenly there, and I say, pardon me, haven't we met. Yeah. And that haven't we met comes in every time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, that means if I'm going to do a catchphrase song like that, and I get a title, like, you know, the sky is so blue, Immediately, I start thinking of rhymes for blue because I know that I'm going to have to say is that. Music buffet. Take what you like, leave the rest. Uh, yeah, I mean that's true in many ways. It is. I a take a lot, though. You know, I, 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 what if I'm a guy who piles my plate like over and over and over? But <laughs> like, you know, not necessarily. Some people just get a bunch of crab legs. But I'm a dude like who wants to have a little bit of everything and just keep going back. So. Uh, I don't leave much of anything at the buffet. 
I think that's a uh, I think that's a good uh, analogy. I I like a lot of different, but actually that is true. I do like a lot of styles of music. Yeah. You know, I'm sure we've talked about this. That's why we too. get along. I think in a, a lot of ways is that like you, you could throw out references that I mostly get. You you're you're more you're more. But you weren't brought up in it. You were deeper into the 70s and 80s like yeah. rock music when I was a, much more into Jesus. The only point, thing I can't way. stand listening to is classical music. Oh, it's oh, the worst. My God, oh my! Oh, it's so it. boring. I can't believe people still fucking you do that. You got to deal with those. What what are they called? Woodwind woodwinds winds. Yeah, oh, I hate those. They're things. just the worst. Now, I've actually gotten to appreciate classical music more talking to you. I actually, you know, I was never an aficionado, but, you know, you've opened that part of the buffet oh, for me. Oh, well, you know, I mean... You've, I, you've unpacked that part of the buffet, I think and I've put that on my plate. The fact that someone who loves music as much as you do uh, wasn't, like, wasn't as familiar with classical music is more more the fault of my end of the business than yours because classical we could go on and on about this but classical music has branded itself as like this Fogey old elitist yeah. m- museum going type of experience when really the people who were writing this stuff Mozart and Beethoven and whatnot were fucked up you know uh, drug addicted alcoholic f- like rock stars who are just like regular people and, and the musicians who make it are also fucked up crazy people and it's if, if classical music had not branded itself as somewhere where you go watch people play for two hours in tuxedos who fucking wants to do that I don't want to do that it's boring as shit yeah I want to go get my drink on I want to get my eat on I want to like hang out with friends and listen to some good music like I would going to see Radiohead you know the funny part I was just thinking about this is even though I wasn't, you know, steeped in classical music growing up, the, I, I always liked parody. I always like classical yes. music Everything isn't is. bad heavy metal. I can stand. There you go. So uh, you know, it depends on your taste, I guess. But with classical music, for me, I you know, I was always a fan of parody. I liked the movie Airplane. Mm-hmm. I liked, you know, a, a Young Frankenstein mm-hmm. and things that were parodying other things. Spinal Tap was like the, the best, the holy grail for me. So. And Holy Grail. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, but I, I do remember really appreciating a lot and going to see one of them, um, PDQ Bach. Yes. And Victor Borga. Victor Borga, I knew yeah. like, back and forth. I used to, I went to see him perform live yeah, you in, know. at the Kennedy Center. And that stuff was brilliant. Yeah. I was the only person of my age group to appreciate Peter it. Peter Shickley is like, wow, Peter Shickley Bach, he's, like, he's a yeah. genius. Yep. He's like not only a good writer, he's a good composer, he's a musicologist, he's fucking brilliant that's the stuff that I appreciated so even though I wasn't into the classical scene I did appreciate the parodies of the yeah, classical scene yeah on the face of it you know I thought from the great. inside if you know like like actual music theory and history like that he really nails some stuff uh, uh, that are that are inside jokes as well that are just as funny from the inside that, that, that the ones that are obvious are from the outside hey you know what I'm noticing about this uh, this chat from the television which yeah. I appreciate is that it? It's uh, delayed slightly in the speaking of it. Yeah. So maybe there's a way we could put it so we can see it, as opposed to hear it. Is that possible? Yeah. And that way we can respond to it without it being kind of delayed. Yeah. 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 Oops. Yeah. Well, Whoa. And we're back. Hey. Uh, let's Let see. Let me do that thing ask. again where I can. Um, yeah. View comments. Oh no, I can do the whole thing here. The settings. Display messages, right. Uh, let me make sure that my message... To, yeah, let me just erase my message to spectators. There you go. Boom. And... Did you see, I saw comments to speech. Did you yeah, turn that there off? there you go. Did you turn that off? Comments to speech? Oh, you want me to turn that off? You don't want her to speak at all? Yeah, <clears> no, I think it's easier if we read it, because otherwise well, we, it just we're sings both, out. But I'll, take uh, it, I'll take that up. If that's okay with you. Yeah, man, hold on. Where was that? The comments Below, to speech. Below, down there, right here. Blank. There you go. So now we can read your comments, Mr. Baltimore. There they are. Comments are always delayed. Yeah, I know. That's why it's easier if we look at yeah, them. Okay, well, now we can read. Thanks, Rock Mr. Baltimore. Well, you're from Maryland, Mr. Baltimore. Hey, that's yeah. uh, hey. I was Rockville myself, but well, Baltimore was just close enough. Fucking D.C., really. Hey, man, it's, it's our major city. It's our. Well, what am I clarinet? It's the city that reads. Rockville. Did you know that? Is that is that the name of the city? The city. Mr. That Baltimore, reads? if he's really from Baltimore, will tell you that it's the city that reads. Uh, I, I think about that. 
Thank you. Let's go O's. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what, uh, what else can I tell you about the show? Well, I mean, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, do you ever, within the skeleton, do you ever just have a moment where you're like, Hey guys, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to slip this song, this style of song here that you turn around? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, there's, it's happened once or twice where I've skipped and I've just given them a different intro, even though I told them, yeah, we're probably going to do this song mm -hmm. next. I'll skip it and say, I just, usually it's not about the, where the show is going. It's usually about timing. Um, there you go. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, usually it's just about, like, listen, we, this song does not work in this spot anymore. So You're it's excessive feeling and feeling the energy and, in the room or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I can usually get a sense of it. And the more I do the show, the more I realize that I can probably do a lot of this show on the fly. Like, I can be a little bit more spontaneous mm -hmm. with it. And I'm kind of looking into ways of making the show even more spontaneous, you know, Um the problem with the styles, though, I gotta say, is a lot of the styles will repeat uh, exactly the same. Like they become set. Mm -hmm. Like the songs were originally just improvised within, within you know whatever musical style people the the accompanist threw in. But now it's like I start doing songs and I'm like, you know, I like I like this part of the song. Let's keep doing that. And the songs themselves, the styles have evolved. So, for example, there's a there's a swing song, right? The swing song. Is oh, just, here we go. Know. This is why I got the guitar out. So it's like you have this, you know. Right? And it's. Dun, 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 and I just liked that style. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. I think I have one of these. Do you? I think this is like a 12 hour blues. Uh, that's not cool. That's not. So, <laughs> an improvising guitar too. Uh, so it started with you know just this swingy kind of thing, kind of walking bass line, and then suddenly we got to a point where I was doing that song, and somebody said, "You know what you should do is uh, I, I wanted to do one where the band sings along. I love when oh, the band yeah, sings yeah, along. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I had to change it up, and now we had a catchphrase that the band would sing mm -hmm. along to, and then." I was doing that for a while, and somebody said, "You know what you should do." One of my accompanists along the way said, "You should, um, you should do a talking part." A what? They're oh, like, you know, yeah. where it goes da da da. I went downtown. I was like, I guess I'll try it. But now that's in there, so I don't want to give that up because it's fun and it's always different, and the audience seems to appreciate it, and it's still a bit of a tightrope walk because the audience goes. How's he gonna make this? He's just talking. It's like it's like improvising rap, which I never do, and don't want to do because there are people much better at it than I am. Yeah. But you know, just being able to do like do the old like scat school scat scat band type of like is it that no? But yeah, you know what I mean. Like that, the forty singers would have like busted into like a, the spoken yes. section. Oh yeah, you can ask my girlfriend this because she made a tape of these for me. I love songs where there's talking in the middle. I do too. You I don't know, know why. I, 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 that's really weird that we have that in common. Well, but I, ink spots. Oh, okay. Do you well, know ink spots? No, but wait, hold on. I'm going to put like a, I'm going to put a spotlight on you so we can. Oh, yeah. Ink spots. The ink spot songs all start the same. You'd recognize them. They're from the '30s, right? So, so. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm over here now. Thank you. Um, but every Ink Spots song, song starts the same. Wait. You know that boom ba dee da boom ba dee da Every Ink Spots song. And the one you know is, I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to start a flame in your heart. So that's Ink Spots, right? Yeah, I know that song from uh, because of Fallout on the uh, <laughs> uh, 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 computer game. Yes, it gets very airy in Fallout, doesn't it? Well, no, it's like it's they have this weird effect where like the the, the oh let me turn this up. Oh. where like the um, the fifties never like went away. You're like theoretically in, oh, in right, a right. post apocalyptic wasteland, but the radio plays a bunch of songs from like the thirties right. and forties and fifties. So every one of their songs starts that way. So it becomes like. I love coffee, I love tea, but, um, but I love the... It's all the same thing, right? Boom, buddy, da, boom, buddy. So the ink spots, every song, they talk in the middle. 
like I don't want to set the world on fire with just yes. so people know. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of the song, this guy says, and I love him because they're always like they make no sense. Like he goes, I don't want to set the world on fire, honey. I love you too much. I just want to start a little flame down in your heart. It's like I love you too much to like destroy everything. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I, would. I just want to start a flame down here with you. But if otherwise, I liked you, if I only liked you a though, little bit, I'd burn the shit. This out. whole place would be gone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So there's a lot of songs like that, and I just find them so entertaining to talk to talk and I even like the song the that game. I do in the show that's the where I usually sometimes I'll bring somebody up on stage and I'll do like a slow jammy song that's like all about being in love right well I have the person I'm with I whisper to them but they do the talking part girl <laughs> you know I've known you a long time <laughs> and you've always been inside my soul you know it's like I just have them do it <laughs> Uh, and it's always just, you know, it goes over really well. So I really, I have like a list of these songs. I used to do that in um, The Nutcracker, actually, because... <laughs> we did a talking part in The Nutcracker? Yeah, well, yeah, actually, um, shit, uh, if I was brave enough, I would get out my, my, my iPhone and play it. The beginning of the pas de deux. Be brave. Be brave. The beginning, I, look, one season I played, I played, I, I look, we were talking about classical mu music before because I'm a classical musician. One season I played, um, I played the Nutcracker, I think, 42 times, uh, and it gets a little boring uh, after, after the, you know, it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging part, actually, um, but it's just like Nutcracker, Pa, okay, so it has this very, like, um, if I could put it up. Oh, thanks. I love I love ads. It's time for a Discover Personal Loan. Fuck off. <laughs> Baby, I just want you to know that I love you and I'll be with you until the end of time. And no matter what happens... Oh, shit, I went into the break! <laughs> God damn it! Much I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You, but you, you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't walk on the post. No, you can't. Oh, no, damn no. it. So you know, after like, like literally, like thirty-five times of that, I'm just like sitting there in the pit with all the other musicians. Well, oh, baby, <laughs> how much I love you. <laughs> well, are you lonesome tonight? Is the obviously yeah. the one that's got the most famous song. Although there is an answer song to that. Did you For know Elvis? That? No, there was an album that people would put out. Uh, in response to big hits. Right. So, Are You Lonesome Tonight, there was a woman who did a song called Yes, I'm Lonesome Tonight. <laughs> oh, I yes. swear to God. No, I think I've heard that. Yeah. And she sings in the middle. She's like, yes, I'm lonesome tonight. You know, and of course, in the middle, he goes, I mean, you lied when you said you loved me, and I had no reason to doubt it. But I'd rather live with you. Like, and she says in her song, she's like, I never lied to you. I was just scared and you're like what? what are you talking about so that's a famous one another one would be um leader of the pack you know there's a response no the, but we're oh. talking yeah, oh, where, yeah, yeah you know she's like when he rode away um you know if he heard i'll never know no 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 look out look out look out look out there's all that you can come back or you, you're a very fickle dog yeah this is a, come on okay, oh. so um yeah i mean there's like there's so many of them. I just think they're they're my favorite things. <laughs> when people talk in the middle of a song. It's, it's like this weird, are, am I taking you seriously now? Right. Or shall I not take you seriously now? Exactly. The song? Maybe I should throw in a kind of an Are You Lonesome Tonight type of song in my show where I can talk a little bit. Actually, I do that already. I, I, there's a lot of stuff. I love all these different styles of songs, and it's fun for me to like unpack them and find out what makes them really... A good song. Well, or unique. What makes them work? What makes them unique to what they are? I see. And, you know, it took me a long time, for example, to figure out a good opening number to the show, opening style. Um, I went through a lot of different ones. And I think it took, I was talking to a guy who, um, who writes, who's a composer and does a lot of cabaret. Um, and uh, he uh, was saying, you know, what you need to do is, it's a song you've got to welcome the audience, tell them what's going to happen, and also, uh, you know, get them comfortable, let them know you're, they're going to be all right. So that's what I started to work on, and I had a whole thing, but it, was, it became difficult. I, I chose a very difficult style to rhyme. There were internal rhymes, 
a lot of very quick words. And I said, okay, why am I starting at a high degree of difficulty? Let's just take out the kind of pattery part of it and make it really simple. And that way you know you'll get the rhymes in and the audience will start going, oh, I see what this is. Mm -hmm. And I can understand it. So it's been like a lot of like measuring out how these things work. And the end of the show, same thing. Something I was like, I knew something had to be uplifting, very big 11 o'clock number where everything so, comes you know, together. I, what is an 11 o'clock number? 11 o'clock number is usually the number, it's usually at the, uh, just before the, the end of the first act in a, uh, in a, in a musical. And it comes at 11 o'clock if the clock is striking midnight for intermission. And it's the, usually the big, the big, big, big number. And it's, uh, and, you know, the big one that everybody talks about is, uh, and I am telling you mm. from, from dream. Those things of memory from cats. It's yes, like somewhere it's, in that post. Right. Or um, there's, I can't remember the one from, from Gypsy, uh, but you musical theater nerds out there if you're watching <laughs> can fill me in. I don't know that much actually, but, um, but there is something that has got to be, it's got to take you from a very low point to this really uplifted, strong, you know, I'm going to come back from the, you know, from the depths moment. And uh, so that was, a, I took off to a lot of different styles. A lot of Stephen Schwartz kind of Wicked type stuff mm-hmm. going on. That's another one, the one from Wicked, um, where, you know, uh, where it's her big number and she flies up in the air right. and uh, things like that. So um, the song from Rent. Gosh, which song from Rent? Uh, hmm. That's a nice guitar. Maybe we should have you play it and sing a little nice bit. Nice guitar. Sure, we could do that. Because I've been working, actually, I've been working a little bit on, a little bit, I'm working on a version of this show that is the singer-songwriter version. Ooh. The kind of like oh. full version. Because there's a lot of parody to be mined at a coffee house singer song. Oh, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you want to? I mean, I don't want to force you to do something, but if you want to do something, I, I don't know if it'll work because I'm not. I'm still working on these styles, and I actually don't have any specific chord progressions that I've been working with. It's also, we should say feel, but... this is my shitty guitar, even though it looks like a nice guitar. It's actually not. So it sounds okay. It sounds okay, but you said that it's a little warped. Or what? Wait, no, okay. Oh, oh, I like that. I give you, I'll give you the. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can do more. I can do more, I'm gonna give you like a, a trippy effect. Um, yeah, so usually what I do is I get a suggestion from the audience, something, um, and sometimes I'll get a suggestion of a style, like, you know, there's all different styles. There's the Springsteen-ish style, there's more of a Bob Dylan style, there's more of the... I'm just doing some screen effects. Just nice. Doing... So we can try, I don't know, let's try something. Let's okay. say... Okay, um, do I have to give you anything? Should I yeah. show, shout things at you? Uh, yeah, shout things okay. at me. Let's say we're looking for... Um, uh, let's say we're looking for a... Uh, common phrase or or you know words to live by let's go with that some sort of like uh, adage or piece of advice leave the seat up um leave the seat up we'll just start with it whatever we get all right all right it's the it's the first thing that came to i can try to like like, i was going to try to give you three like i'll just i'll just pick that one it's the first i always like the first one that comes out all right i have no idea what this means but song I wrote the other night. (laughs) (laughs) I went to bed at midnight, tucked in my son and my daughter, went to the kitchen and got out a glass and poured myself Come 3 a.m. and I'm blue. Can't find my way in the night. But I made it all the way to the bathroom. And I thought for a moment it would be alright. And I said, please leave the seat up when you're finished. Seat up for me. Please leave the seat up, it will never diminish. 
But that way I won't hit it when I pee. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank okay, you very much. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, that's like you. a singer-songwriter type of... <laughs> I don't know. What, what always cracks me up about what you do is that, you know, I've seen a lot of crappy... Yeah, I took that away for you. But, like, we could add some trippy, like, uh, effects if you want. I mean, uh... Be in this, like... Whoa! Oh, shit! Or this, this is what I call Coachella. <laughs> This is sort of my Coachella experience. Oh, hey, wow. Whoa, dude! Can you can you do an effect that makes my legs look less white? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe we'll a little just, tan. Put some black and white so it's big tan. Yeah, that's it. Now it's just now it's like the, my knees are like beacons. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Wait a minute! I have one for that. I think. <laughs> knee beacons. Where do you think shiny? Oh yeah. Your, your, your knees are giving off like a slight a, a slight glow. I can see that. My nose, I'm like Rudolph. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fun joke. <coughs> Thank you, PlayStation. Yeah, I did realize like what a sort of like a uh, actual production studio this thing is, but like I I'll use more of this stuff later as I get more kind of used to it. Now uh, thanks for that, by the way. I, I was going to say the thing that that, that that I love that you add is like you add the setup from the beginning. There are a lot of times that I've seen people do either regular improv or musical improv where they really get to the joke just at the very end or the rhyme just at the very end. But you set up the rhyme from the very beginning <laughs> of, of that, you well, know, and that's what I, I what cracks me up the most. Maybe not the most, but one of the things that cracks me up the most about your your cabaret is that you do you set these things up from the very start of the song, and it's not always evident, but as as it dawns on the crowd that it's that this has been set up since the beginning of the song are the funniest moments in the show for me because hearing the crowd kind of get it <laughs> and realize that this joke has been in like in process for the last thirty seconds makes it sound like, makes it sound like it's been written before. Yeah, yeah no, it's which really is kind of. The, the idea is to try to make people think these are songs, well, not make them, but, but it's supposed to sound like songs that have been written. Before. Right. And that's the real genius of, of what you do, I think, mm. and the reason that I think that it Thank makes you. it. I think that the, 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 there was a review that you shared on Facebook that basically said the same thing, that it felt like these songs had been written and been, had been in existence for like years and that you were just simply performing them for people on the stage. Yeah, there's a delicate balance because you... Um, when I first did the show and I didn't have any arc and I didn't have um, I didn't know exactly what the show was people the the comment I got most often was I, I had no idea oh, oh so good so <laughs> that was my girlfriend thank you oh thank you um, thank you Mr. Baltimore for being here yeah nice to meet you too so uh, the uh, yeah the experience was was that people would say I was really nervous at first because I wasn't sure what you're, you're going to be able to do it. But after a couple songs, I realized, don't worry about it. He's yeah. got this in hand. But that's not quite what I want because once people relax, it loses the effect. You really want people to be, it's like a magic show. Uh -huh. So you want people to have that kind of edge of like, oh, is this going to happen or not happen? So what I started doing was I started increasing the degrees of difficulty through the show yeah. in order to, it's just like a magic act. You know, if I did a card trick for you, and I said, is this your card? You would be like, whoa, I didn't, how did you do that? If I did the same trick again, the yeah. second time, you'd be like, you got it again. By the fifth time, you'd be like, well, I totally, I don't know how you're doing it, but I totally That's expected my yeah, card. Right. And I'm just like, okay, cool, great. So I have to change things up. I do I do a number in the show that's a, a medley. <laughs> you know, it's like I pick five suggestions and I do a medley that defines a show that could have been based with these five songs in it. And... Uh, you also set yourself up like you set the entire song and premise up and then get the title, which I think is also like really <laughs> crazy. It's... You really hamstring yourself into uh, in, into doing this style of song, no matter what ridiculous suggestion you're about to get from the audience. Yeah, you better you better you're gonna have to live with it. But, yeah, you know, one of you don't throw like... them away either. That's what like you don't. Not often. Every now and again. Like if, well, maybe for <laughs> as the medley. Joke. I've seen you do that. But. As a joke, I've, I've thrown them away. But 
but yeah, no, I try to stick just like with you. It's like you gave me that suggestion. If I had to pick one of the three, it's like I'm going to pick the easiest right. way out. It's more fun for me if uh, I'm like, you got to make that work. Right. So make that work. And and honestly, you know, when you're talking about like setting things up from the beginning, this is a, a technique that I think a lot of improvisers and especially music improvisers are familiar with. But so I don't know how they learned it or studied it, but I know when I uh, was in college, we came up with the, this notion of something called um, uh, go, going to the elbow. I, and I don't know, just someone was describing it. It was like, you know, you're going to you're gonna end here. So when you get a suggestion, go all the way down here and then work your way back. So don't think of the first thing that you think of from that suggestion. Think of the first thing and then the second thing. And if you can get to the third thing and then we're going to really back, just jam the whole, jam the whole thing, thing in there. That's my point. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, the first thing that happens is like... There's a song request. I don't know if you know that song. Ozuna Criminal. I don't. But, uh, Sorry, Fred Flintlock. I could make one up called those the criminal, and I could call myself a mm-hmm. Um But no, I mean, literally, you just take something like that suggestion you gave me, leave the seat up. And so I start thinking, okay, this is a story about a guy who wants the seat up, okay? Which is supposed to leave the seat down, <laughs> which is different, because most people would request the seat down. No, so I start thinking, yeah, leaving okay, the seat up. up. So I start thinking about peeing, and I start thinking about water so I start thinking about rhymes with water and rhymes with pee and I start thinking about it'll happen in the middle of the night when you can't see whether it seats up or down that's when the biggest problems are so it's like as soon as I get the suggestion that's where my head goes I go away from it away from it and so I start thinking about you know we're at night instead of going to the bathroom first I'll lead into that I'll go be out before that yeah. then get to the bathroom so that becomes a bit of second nature you start thinking about like here's where I'm at let's go far away from it and come back to it and um, the ability to split your brain like that is a term for it that I don't know what it is, but the ability to be talking right. and thinking at the same time is uh, is something that I think just uh, is gets honed the more you do it. It's practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, clearly you have to have a knack. Not, a, not every Joe Schmo is going to be able to just be like, I'm going to practice that and then I'm going to be able to think and patter at the same time. Yeah. I mean, there's skill involved, but like any sort of high level thing... It's, like it's that practice. It's, it's like the... chess too. You know, I I think if I if I wanted to play chess, I'd probably be I'd probably be able to learn it quickly. But I'm not. I'm too impatient for chess. Yeah, me too. I, I can't think seven. No, moves me down. either. Like, I don't want to. I don't I want, want to spend that kind of time. I want to get that horse. I really want to go. Yeah, I know Saul's going to kick my ever loving ass yeah. when he learns how to play chess. Yeah, he's got that. Problem. He already kicks my ass in Uno. Really? So yeah, so it's like chess is like forget about. It. He knows how to play Texas Hold'em, by the way. Now. Oh good, bring him in. I'm going to bring him in for a hand, but he has to win. He's got cash, I'm sure. (laughs) Well, he always demands three extra $100 chips, so he's going to to help. Wait, how do you... I never tried that. (laughs) Chris, I demand $300 chips. Give me extra $300. Give me extra chips. We'll feel like playing at the casino against those fucking (laughs) rooms. Big fucking stacks. Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, that's that's my show, and I am working on this Coffee House version. I'm not sure in what I love that idea. It's like, that would be... By yourself with a guitar for an hour would be insanity. That well, would be so hard. It would be. Uh, I'd probably still want to get a drummer or a mm-hmm. cajon player, you know, mm-hmm. or uh, and a bassist. And but I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't set a skeleton as much. Um, I might have some styles that I like, but what I really want to do is because I have control as opposed to the piano. Mm-hmm. I have control of the instrument. So, like for example, in that last song. I held on a G chord longer than normal. You know, I, I took I had it I held it for an extra measure just because I thought it would be a nice lead into the chorus. So I wouldn't be able to do that without having to set that. Mm-hmm. So in that case, what I would do, I've been thinking about a lot, is set myself up and then have the bass player and the drummer in other corners kind of towards me. And if they're decent uh, drummers I'm not worried about, they can follow a lot of things quickly. Bass player would have to be more obviously more melodic, so um, but if they were watching me, a good bass player would be able to follow what I'm doing. So if I get a good bass player and a good drummer, I could set it up to have a kind of little combo. But um, and it's more interesting than having just me up there for an hour. Uh, this, so I I would be interested in seeing you do that for an hour, but uh, maybe the maybe like, particular. I have to come up with these stuff first. I have no idea what the story of this thing is and what it. It took me years to come up with the. Uh, 
to develop the cabaret one. So I don't know. Hopefully this one will happen quicker. But uh, again, it's just a matter of going back and and looking at um, different styles and finding out what styles do what, what's how certain styles work. Is this a am I defining a a, a cab a singer that is more into country and western music? Or is more of a storyteller like Harry Chapin, or is more of a Jim Croce kind mm. of guy. Or... Well, it could be different every night. Right? It absolutely I mean... could be. I mean, I have I I parodied. I tried the guitar to parody uh, Mumford and Sons, which is just you know. All right, come on, let's do some. It's you just gotta you gotta um, uh, give me a a, a a beat that's hitting on the one and three. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Mumford and Sons style. Springsteen's got so many styles, depending on if you're looking at, like, you know, Come on, what album. Just, well, which album? Oh, thank you. Well, creative. Compartmentalize. Creative. Well, then you're talking about putting your brain in different people. So, uh, what, what uh, see, what Springsteen are we talking about? Are we talking about... Uh, I want broody, like, uh, Tom Joad, like, oh, isn't that, like, the ballad of uh, so when, when he gets into his southern, yeah, his southern, yeah. hand in the see a lot of Springsteen. Springsteen's kind of mimicking other people in that uh, in that world. So he's good want, at it. You want Springsteen, actual Springsteen? Springsteen would have to have something where you reference cars or right. motorcycles okay. or roads. All right. You know what I mean? So, so like know, old Jersey. Yes. So I've been now working on the street again, and my car's getting ready to roll. And you know that I ain't leaving you, Cindy, till we get old. Get in my car, we'll ride the streets together. And maybe someday we'll come back again. Though if we go far, at least with the weather. Kind of style yeah, yeah. Springsteen. You've got, you know, that kind of grow up in the land, that thing. So it's like really finding who has what style. As a matter of Springsteen is a good. Uh, I, I saw the Springsteen show. Yeah, I heard it was awesome. It was like, great. Yeah, I guess you you know if you don't see it on Broadway, you can see it on Netflix coming up. In oh, December. Nice. I actually watched that. And he's very uh, flowery with his um, language. It's it's very prose. It's it's clearly written out and very similar to how he writes his books, and the songs are very selected. Some are really big popular songs you know. Some are deeper cuts, uh, but they all tell this story of his life. So part of me is like maybe that's the that's the quality of the songwriters. He's telling you the story of how he got to where he is, mm -hmm. but by playing all these different songs and maybe he's gone through different styles like Dylan has, mm -hmm. you know, or like Springsteen has. So there's that. That's a possibility. The other possibilities are, you know, somebody who's a protest singer, you know, and just sticks with one similar style. Phil Oaks era. style. Phil Oaks or even uh, Guthrie, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And all those type of songs. Um, Straight up folky, chord based. Sure. Throw in your, you know, your, you know, uh, Peter, Paul and Mary-esque, you know, mm -hmm. I've been traveling down the road, you know, that kind of stuff. And you know, here, let's try one of those. Why don't you give me a? All right, uh, okay. Um, uh, give me a phrase of some kind, any kind of like catchphrase or um, something you've heard. Or... Um, shit. Uh, 
I'm trying to think of something pithy. I'm trying to think of tuning sh thirds a little low, but that doesn't really matter. Tuning thirds. Tuning, you're tuning, you know. Um, <laughs> well, we can go off of that. Something with you, the word low in it. All right. Well, I'll just do what my dad, my dad always gave me a piece of advice. Yeah. Because uh, I was a pretty good wrestler, and then one time I was wrestling a dude, and I was, and I was, uh, I was cocky, and I was sort of standing up straight, and he was like, stay low! Stay low. So my dad always like when he now like even now he's eighty he, he ends every phone conversation with stay low. So Does he really? Probably, yeah. So I'll, I'll oh. say stay low is my. Stay low. Is uh, that too so, short? No. You know, who knows what too short is? You know, but if you got like you're doing that folky. Yeah, you can vamp for a while on the folky thing, right? And sort of like get your thoughts. You can too. talk a lot. Of, you can just talk because they always talk at the beginning of a song. When I was fourteen years old. I was wrestling. My father would come to me. And I always heard in my life you should stand up straight. But my father knew different. He knew to stay low. Life gets hard and you're wrestling. Wrestling with your feelings inside. You think you've got your feelings pinned. And your arms are held open wide. They tell you in this life, stay, hold your, hold your chin high wherever you go. But if you want to stop yourself getting knocked out, you always should learn to stay low. Stay low, stay low if you're wrestling. Stay low, stay low, stay low. Don't go high. Stay. Messing with you, and then you know just why. Something like that. I don't hey, know. whatever it is. I appreciate you. So there's that like, kind of thing. Yeah, there's all yeah. these different different styles you can play. So I'm not sure what the the tenor of the show. There's is so yet. much there, though. I mean, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, certainly with your own instrument, you'll be you're, you're you're facile as fuck, and you know, as you just you can. That's something that you can sit and practice literally all day. It is, and it's, for me, it's it's really like. Just like with the cabaret show, I would listen to songs and go, ooh, I want to do a song like mm -hmm. that. I want to do a song like that. I want to do a song like that. The difference is, in a cabaret setting, usually the person does a variety of styles. That's just the nature of a cabaret. They're going to do the version of a... They're going to do a tap number. They're going to do this kind of dark, stormy number that shows their heart. Uh, but if you look at a lot of performers who do... Uh, coffee house or you know these type of things you got you don't have as much a range it's the, the people stick with a certain style and like you know you know a paul simon song from a paul mm -hmm. simon song so unless you're doing a parody of a guy who can perform everybody else's styles it's yeah. not you can't really put a story to it as well or a, right a and you like to inhabit a character for the duration of the show i think that's really important actually to to for me that i think that's that makes it an evening and right. not just a collection of funny songs right and I think that, that, for me, it makes it more interesting. I think it's more compelling. That's also artists. something that you get from the audience, too. You get the name of the dude. You yeah, get, like, where, where he's from. from. And then from that, you're like, you know, all right, maybe I'm outside of Cleveland, and that's my first whatever. Yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. I love how you, you know, that that all of that thought goes into to something that you then have to, like, fly by the seat of your pants. Terry Tibbs is writing to me. Yeah, he's asking oh, about Terry Lenny it's, it's, Yes, Lenny. Yeah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. Yes, all those Both good. Jews, though, right? So I think Jews, but not that. related. We worked on. Uh, I worked on a little genealogy chart. Oh, and, yeah. uh, found uh, that uh, that Z are, is important. The S and the Z is. Like, it is. That was my grandfather's <laughs> invention. He only used it half the time, but we stuck with it. The know. Y was also like a relative's invention. Like I'm, I'm from an I, G R I M E S. But yeah. the, like, listen, Kravitz is Russian for Taylor. So oh it's yeah. Like, not all the tailors in the Taylor clan are related. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know a lot of those guys. You know all the tailors? Yeah, let me ask you one other question before sure. we close this out. No, oh, yeah. You've done like you've done shows all over the world now. All over the world. In all the English speaking countries. <laughs> right. Yes. You haven't done your show in Spanish. Uh, right. you, there's no SAP for the Jason Kravis experiment. Rocket Man is an easy song to spoof. This is correct. That's true. That's true. Um is there a difference between American audiences and, like, you, you know what songs are necessarily going to resonate with an American audience because you've lived here basically your whole life, but do those songs resonate in Australia? Certain styles do and certain don't. 
You Which know? ones don't? Well, a New York audience is much more savvy to Broadway stuff. So, for example, if I said Jason Robert Brown to a New York audience, everybody would know who that was. A lot of people in the audience would understand the parody of the style. Outside of New York, they know they might know a song or two of his, but they might not know it's him. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have the name recognition of a Sondheim, and more people would know what a Sondheim is. So I have to be really careful about how I introduce certain songs, and I have to change the introductions of certain songs. But mostly what I'm doing, it feels universal. There's uh, there's certain qualities that seem universal. I found the Australian audiences... I performed in Australia, London, Edinburgh. and On a big boat. And on a big boat in the ocean and here. And L.A. and D.C. So there's, you know, I performed in a bunch of different places. Uh, I don't... I think that... Um, London audiences are a little more reserved. Uh, Australian audiences are, are very uh, uh, appreciative, uh, vocally appreciative. Uh, Edinburgh audiences are drunk <laughs> a lot of the time. I don't know. Maybe not true, but it's what it seemed like. And then, um, and willing to participate loudly. And then, um, <laughs> that's fun, though. I mean, no, I, fun. you could play with whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know that there's that much difference. What I did notice is that. As I've done the show in a variety of places, I've done it for a variety of ages. And it seems to play well with a big house or a small house or a older audiences or a younger audiences. When I did the cruise ship, the average age was 70. You know, when I performed in D.C., the average age was 40-something. In New York, it's a little younger. It's like, it just... And, and I've had young people see the show. My, my son is 16. He's seen the show a lot, and he likes it. And his people that, that have his age have come to the show, and they like it in a whole different way. It's mm. just, that's what I like being able to do. And I performed for uh, 17 people in an apartment for a birthday party, and it went great. And then uh, when I was in Australia, I had to do a number for 2,000 people. Yikes. And that was uh, a lot of fun, too, and, and seemed to go over well. So, you know, I like the fact that it, it has, you can adjust a little bit here and there. Like for 2,000 people, you have to do a different, do a, a bit differently than when you're doing in a room with 17 people. Right, right. But I really, uh, I think the show's got a lot of uh, range to it, and I, I kind of enjoy that. So, yeah. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming and hanging out on a Saturday with me in the Man Cave. Thanks yeah, again. Right. I'm sure we'll... Hopefully I have another future edition. I appreciate all the music making. That's much more than I expected you to play. Me too, actually. And uh, that made me really happy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Baltimore, for sticking in the whole time. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, and, hopefully uh, uh, next time you see me, I'll shower. For this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's <laughs> my fault. I should have told you we were going to put it on video, and I didn't. Yeah. I'm the worst. No, it's all Wait, okay. oh, holy shit. Did we lose? Wait, uh, no. Oh, I'm going to stop.